Seems good. I wasn't actually sure what I was going to talk about for a while. Um, ultimately, uh, I've talked about a lot of topics uh, over a long period of time, and I just finished wrapping up my the third uh, time I contributed significantly to a package management management tool, and I figured maybe now's a good time to revisit what is important about those tools. Um, it's actually, uh, so I'll, I'll go into a few details before I say anything more. Uh, first of all, if you don't know uh, th what I'm talking about, I worked on Bundler and Cargo for Rust, and I worked on now Yarn, which is a new package manager that uh, Facebook did a lot of the work on, but a lot of other uh, community members did work on it. Um, that is now a, a replacement for the NPM package manager. Uh, like Bundler, it's, it's not like a replacement in the sense that you never have to think about NPM ever again. Uh, it sort of serves the same role as it provides some additional benefits for applications, still leaving a lot around the registry and the actual NPM tool for the traditional use cases. Uh, just like RubyGems still exists, even though Bundler exists. So the sort of general uh, goal for me about package management, the reason I got into it in the first place, uh, is that I was working on I was working on Merb, and one of our goals for Merb was to have a lot more a lot more dependencies. So Rails at the time had very very few dependencies. Almost all the dependencies were vendored, um, and even if somebody cared enough to add a dependency like uh, like an ERB library or like sanitization library, almost always we uh, or they copied and pasted the exact version of that library into Rails, and then it became, it stagnated in there. And when I was working on Merb, I really didn't think that that was the best, uh, best approach. So I started, I said, we have these things called gems, why don't I just use gems? And pretty quickly, as I started to do that in Merb, we discovered that there were some pretty major problems with just using gems, especially around how you're supposed to get the right versions of everything in the right place at the right time. Um, so, but for me, really, what fundamentally package management is about is it's about our ability to take a community and build up and up and up and up and up and not have the entire foundation that we're on continually fall into quicksand every single time something weird happens. Every single time we run npm install, uh, the universe might reboot. And I think that's not, that's not an ideal situation. Um, that, that's not to rag on npm or any package manage manager, really. I think um, everybody, including Bundler, uh, made mistakes at various points. But the bottom line is that in order to build Pi, you have to have a stable foundation at every level. And uh, this talk is really about what, all the, what, all, as, what are some of the most important pieces that I think are important. So um, it's sort of similar to that blog post you might have seen floating around, like, so you want to build a package manager, except I don't really recommend anyone do that. Um, but I think it could be good to understand how things are working. So I also wanted to say package management is one of the most high leverage uh, tools in a programming language ecosystem. And little mistakes that you make in your package manager and can have reverberate into really massive problems down the road. Uh, and even package managers that feel like everything is working, people are happy, everything's great, you know, everybody's everybody feels good about it, um, usually end up, if they don't follow, they don't pay a lot of attention to what they're supposed to be doing, end up with a lot of problems that people don't really understand the root cause of. And unfortunately, when everybody in the world spends an hour every day wrestling with their package manager, which is a real thing that happens in some communities, people don't necessarily think, oh, that's because the package manager is designed wrong. They might not have any context to even understand what's going on. This is something that I experienced a lot and motivated me to get into Yarn. Um, so before I get started, I just want to explain some terms because uh, everything, about, everything about package management is confusing in various ways, so I want to get out there what I'm talking about. I'm inventing some terms for this, uh, for this talk, but having now built three package managers, I don't think any of the existing terms are very helpful, so I'll try to explain why I've created some new jargon that you need to absorb to understand the rest of my talk. Sorry. Um, First of all, uh, there's this thing called a global package manager. And the idea behind a global package manager is that it is installing things into a global place. Right? So tr traditionally, you would think of things like apt or homebrew or yum, emerge, system package. Pe people sometimes call these things system package managers because they install packages into your system. Um, however, it's actually also true that the RubyGems, not Bundler, but RubyGems and PIP are also global in the sense that when you say gem install, you're installing something into a global place. And there's no reproducibility of what you've just done except for someone else to try to type the same thing. And hopefully this thing that comes out the other end when they type the same command is the same thing. But there's really no guarantee about that. So I don't like using the term system package managers because uh, you're not installing a system or 
necessarily. Um, and I'll talk in a second why I don't like other terms for the other thing. But basically, global package manager just means you're installing stuff into a global place. And uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to use the term local package manager to refer to the thing that Bundler and Cargo and Yarn are. Um, sometimes people call these things application package managers. I find that term pretty confusing because you're not installing applications, you're installing packages. Um, sometimes they're called application level package manager, but if I had to say that 100 times for the next 45 minutes, I would kill myself. So um, I think local package manager is, is the, best, the best I can do, the best I was able to do here, basically install stuff into a local space instead of a global space. Um, so you're probably familiar with local package managers from all kinds of different places. I actually started doing this and then I'm like, everybody does it, I can't enumerate all the things. But basically these are, these are systems where you run something morally equivalent to bundle install or npm install um, and you, get a, you have a manifest in that directory. So instead of installing something globally, there's a thing in the directory that you check into version control that says the list of things that you're trying to install and then uh, in various ways, the results of what you have just done are scoped to the directory that you're inside of. That doesn't, uh, only Node, as far as I know, actually installs everything literally in that directory, but uh, in various ways, every system more or less makes the results of what you have just done scoped to the directory that you're inside of. Now, uh, interestingly, before I was reminiscing about my work on Bundler, um, before we worked on Bundler, there, was the, there were a couple of projects that were uh, becoming popular. Uh, one of them was called RIP, which was like Ruby pip, and another one was called RPG, and I don't remember what it stood for. But basically the way both RIP and RPG worked is they said, the problem with gem install, so it's hard to remember because uh, things are much better now, but the problem with gem install was you could have multiple copies of a gem in your system and you didn't actually know which one would get installed. So the idea behind uh, RIP and RPG was, we'll just actually make sure that there's only one copy of a particular gem in your entire system. Of course, this is not very satisfying because it's totally reasonable to be working on a Rails 4.2 and a Rails 5 app at the same time, and there's just literally no way to do that. Um, however, so people say, oh, that seems annoying. So what's the solution? The solution is we'll add another layer of isolation on top. So uh, RVM gem sets were a thing that sort of coincided with Bundler coming to exist. And that's basically saying, we'll take the global concept and we'll make a namespace around it. But hopefully you can observe now that we have added many layers of additional namespacing and isolation primitives. Some, some of these things are actually like system level isolation, just to deal with the fact that what we really want is a local package manager. Um, I think isolation in general is a nice thing to use with, with global package managers. So for example, Flatpak, is a thing that the GNOME project has built to make it easier to install like the GIMP nightly without messing with the rest of your system. They use this containerization technology and things like that. I think that makes a lot of sense if the thing you're actually installing is global. But if the thing you're installing is not global, I think these technologies are kind of irrelevant. And I think most people, uh, sometimes people ask questions on Stack Overflow, uh, what's, should I use RVM gem sets with Bundler? And the answer that most people say is no. So today, in general, we're going to be talking about local package managers, not global package managers. Um, I also consider calling these like programming language packaging, package managers, but uh, the fact that RubyGems and uh, PIP are global package managers, but programming language made this very confusing. So basically, what we're going to be talking about today is package managers where you go into a directory, and there's something like a gem file in there, and you run something like bundle install, and then you get some stuff that is locally scoped to your directory. And I'm calling these things local package managers. So there's a couple of things that are non-obvious goals but have become very important to me over time as I've worked more and more on this problem. Um, and I would say in the beginning, my main goal was just to make it possible for Rails to be, uh, to be composed of more things. But as I got more and more involved in the core languages and especially in Rust, as I got more and more involved in working on Rust itself, it became clear to me that one of the things that you get out of a really good package ecosystem that is well designed is the ability for, for people to build things that maybe could be in the standard library, but uh, would be very annoying for they're in the standard library. They might stagnate, there's only one copy, it has to be upgraded together with your, with your system, with your version of Ruby or whatever. So uh, a really good package ecosystem allows us to iterate on things that maybe should or could be in the standard library, but do it in, in, the, in the outside ecosystem. So uh, enabling an ecosystem with rich dependency graphs, allowing the ecosystem to innovate in areas historically in the domain of really big standard libraries. And then the third one is a little subtle, but it's making it possible for common abstractions. So for example, in the NPM ecosystem, uh, 
streams are a built-in part of Node, but promises, which are really pretty similar to streams, are actually not part of Node. They're a third-party library. And the fact that the NPM package management has some manager has some limitations actually makes a very stark distinction between how you can use streams, which is basically you can just assume there's only one of them and it's everybody has the same one, and how you have to use promises where you're assuming there might be, you know, potentially hundreds of copies of various promise libraries. Now, I know when I start talking about, uh, like, oh, I really want it to be possible to take a big, uh, you know, take something like an net HTTP and break it up into a lot of little pieces, people say, oh, all you're doing is you're, you know, are you going to have a package for every status code? Or are you going to have a package for every header? First of all, no, obviously that's not what we're doing here. But second of all, there's actually some really good benefits that you get from breaking things up a lot more than people have traditionally done. So um, I'm not actually going to go into Cargo, but the Cargo, it uses Cargo itself. And there's a, a neat tool that is sadly written in Python. Someone should rewrite it in Rust probably. Um, that will just give you a dot file for your, car, so for your lock file. So you, you may or may not know this, but if you look at a, a, gem, a gem file.lock or a cargo.lock or a yarn.lock, um, basically any of these lock files, all it really is is a serialization of the, of the dependency graph in, a, in the lock file. So you can basically write a tool that parses that file or uses the built-in parser already and emit a graph. It's pretty easy. So this is Cargo. Um, I think it's pretty interesting because when we, of course, when we started writing Cargo, we didn't have Cargo. So of course, we had no dependencies that use Cargo. But because Cargo was so useful, it very quickly got to the point where Cargo itself has huge amounts of dependencies and pretty involved graph. Um, Servo itself has such a big uh, dependency graph that if I put, so Servo is uh, Mozilla's new browser engine um, that they, there's been a bunch of hype around. They actually just had an announcement about it yesterday. Um, I'm just looking at the CSS parser here. <laughs> if I put the whole thing up here, it would basically just be a black screen. It's a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, and just the CSS parser you can see has like Win, AP, Win API. It has like this matches thing. It has an encoding library, but then the encoding library has like many things, including like separate packages for simple Chinese. Uh, the RAN, like the tempter crate depends on the RAN crate, which depends on the libc crate. Um, right, so there's a lot of stuff going on here, and you might be like, ah, oh, this seems silly. Now, what's kind of interesting, and I just did, I could have probably done this for like all the things and had a really comprehensive result here, but I, I'm not gonna do that. Um, if you just look at encoding, so encoding was just that, that one thing up there on the top, and this is just one package of many, many packages. If you just look at encodings, the reverse dependencies already in the Rust ecosystem of the encoding library are 30 different packages. And of course, that's Unsurprising, um, I, in the Rails project would love to be able to use a browser's encoding library for its encoding library. That would be awesome, right? That would basically mean that we would be guaranteed that we're having, we have the right encoding library. And so in Rust, the fact that Servo broke out the encoding crate into its own thing that anyone can use ma meant that rapidly a lot of other people doing things that may or may not have anything to do with um, the web uh, started to make use of these, of these projects. And what that means is that all of these individual projects, all these 30 projects, are contributing to the encoding crate. And so instead of having one project and you have to become a servo contributor to contribute to these pieces that are part of this big blob, no matter how well factored it is, now we have these little, these smaller blobs, and the smaller blobs are a lot easier for people to contribute to. Um, I was talking to a member of the servo team last, a couple weeks ago, and he told me that they basically have a, a rule of two, which is, as soon as any part of the servo project, there's a, as soon as there's a, another consumer for any part of the servo project, they break it out into a crate. And the reason for that is that inst now instead, let's say the encoding library no one cared about before, or the CSS parser, right? CSS parser you can imagine many good uses for that have nothing to do with being a CSS engine, right? So as soon as there was at least one other project that wanted to use a CSS parser library, that's the point where they break it out and create a and create the, uh, AP, a public API and, and versioning and stuff like that. And I think that's pretty interesting because even though they have that rule, they still have a huge amount of, of broken up packages to the point where you might be asking yourself, what's the point? And the interesting thing about this is that by breaking up code into smaller pieces, you massively, in, you massively increase the total number of people who can work on the whole project, right? So I think, I, don't, I was actually asking the servo team earlier today for the most up-to-date version of the stats, but so, a very small percentage of the total servo code, it's, it's not like 1%, but it might be like 20 or 30, is actually in the servo repo. Um, something like 70% of the code, I'm just making this up because I couldn't get the real numbers, but it's something in, in this ballpark, um, is things like the encoding crate, the CSS crate, the style library, all these things that are separate and have more other uh, contributors other than people contributing to servo. 
And I think that this is pretty, pretty interesting and a pretty good way of improving contributions to your project. Um, Ember has a sort of similar story. Um, Angular contributes to our router library. They uh, use our CLI tool, right? So I think the more you can think about ways to find other contributors, to find other possible contributors to some part of your project and break it out so they can help, the more the cost of the API boundary and the versioning starts to pay off. And the way I like to think about it is that if you look at, uh, if you break up a project into 100 crates, the number of contributors that you get are the union of all of those individual crates, right? So it's the people who want to contribute to a CSS, par CSS parser, and people who want to contribute to an encoding library, and the people who want to contribute to an actual web browser, right? All these things. Whereas if you put everything into one project, the, all the contributors are all the people who want to contrib contribute to the intersection of all those use cases, the people who want to contribute only to Servo itself. And, I, and it just in practice turned out to be a humongous difference between these two scenarios. And in order to make these non-obvious goals work, in order to make an ecosystem where you don't need a standard library uh, or you can get away with a smaller one because the package manager is good enough to be the standard library, you really need a great deal of predictability and largely that's what the rest of my talk is about. So the way I'm structuring this talk is just to give you some uh, thoughts on what a good local package manager looks like. So, and I'll just, I'm just gonna go through, it's not really, um, it's not going to be, the narrative flow is not going to be amazing. It's sort of like a list, but hopefully it will be okay. So <laughs> um, a good local package manager, first of all, and this is not really connected so much to everything else, but it's sort of an axiom that everything else flows from. It's primarily a tool for human beings to share and manage workflows with each, with each other. That's primarily the goal. Um, and it's secondarily important that it be automatable, that it work together inside of people's build infrastructure, build tools, but it's not really something that you should mo mostly think about as being something that's uh, mostly about automation. It's actually mostly about how human beings communicate with each other, which is true about a lot of software, but I think this is something people can easily forget about package managers. Um, when I say that package managers are about shared workflow, it actually is a little deceptive what I mean by that. Um, the way Cargo works, so by the way, the reason I talk about Cargo a lot in this talk is because Cargo was basically the first and probably only time that I will ever get to build the whole thing from scratch. So it basically meant that I got to try a bunch of stuff that I had like fantasy land, I wish I could do this, and I know now whether these things worked or not. So there's some things that I can't talk about in terms of bundler or yarn because I couldn't, I basically had to work with what we had. So. The way Cargo uh, manages the workflow is that there, these are, like, I would say, the main workflows, uh, release, dev, test, bench, and doc, and each of those correspond to a particular thing that you type in the command line, right? So you can write Cargo build, or you can write Cargo test, or you can write Cargo bench, or you can write Cargo doc. And each one of those profiles, you don't have to understand Rust and don't need to really read this, but each one of those profiles is represented internally by a bunch of information, by uh, what's the optimization level, should you do link time optimization, uh, should you include debug information? Is it a test? Is it, are you running tests? How should you panic? And in practice, because of the fact that we're talking about a workflow, we're talking about running cargo build, and not cargo build dash dash code gen units equals whatever, which is a lot of times what you have to do with tools like Rust, you never actually have to think about what it means to be, built, to be running in test mode. You just have to know that test mode exists, and everyone shares one meaning for test mode. So here's, again, Cargo's built-in profiles. There's sort of an interesting uh, thing that we did with Cargo, which is that, of course, for a, a tool like, like uh, in the Rust ecosystem, people have a lot of needs. People are building stuff for you know, Android NDK. People are using weird linkers. They're cross-compiling, who knows what. So while we have a built-in definition for what dev means, and these are the defaults, you can actually just go into your cargo.toml and override what, pro what the dev profile means. But notably, what you are not doing is saying, I just have a totally ad hoc profile. It's called like my company's own dev. No, you have a, you have a dev profile like everyone else. It's what happens when you run cargo build, and you get to tweak it for your, own, uh, for your own needs. And that means that for the most part, I talked about this yesterday on the panel a little bit. Uh, for the most part, that means that people share a sense of what these core workflows are. So if you go to Stack Overflow and you say, I'm running cargo build dash dash release, that has a very strong meaning, even though you can go in and change the, link, the linker if you need to, or change what happens when you panic. And fundamentally, if you're a person working on a project that 
does some tweaking, you still think, if you jump into the servo project, and they did some tweaking, and they do, if you, you still know that you run cargo build to build, and cargo build dash dash release to build a release build, and cargo test to run the tests. And that basically means that everyone has a shared sense of what it is that's going on, and it allows us to build up. So that's what I mean by fundamentally these tools are about establishing shared workflows for the, for the ecosystem that they're inside of. And by the way, that's also why uh, it does not turn out to be very easy to build one package manager for once and for all because the idioms that each ecosystem have for various reasons, like Cargo actually needs to build, compile code, and, and Bundler doesn't. Um, there's a bunch of different things that, that are different that make it really hard to build once and for all. I think I would be very surprised if 10 years from now we don't have some kind of framework for doing it. I think that's pretty likely. But it's not the case that there's just like, you could just use Bundler in, in Rust and have that make sense. Or you could use Cargo in Ruby and have that make sense. Generally, that's not true. So I said a good package manager is, a, is about workflow. Um, and I'm distinguishing throughout this talk between a good pack, local package manager and what I'm calling a great local package manager. I think a great local package manager adopts the norms of Semver, the semantic versioning, as the core way that people communicate breaking changes through the ecosystem. Um, the reason, so people ask, and this is a thing that, hap that people ask when we first started uh, working on Cargo, and Cargo has a very, very strong commitment to Semver in the sense that if you leave off the, an operator, so if you don't write equals 1.0.0, if you just say 1.0.6, that's the same thing as the hat operator in JavaScript and means Semver compatible. So people said, why are you committing so much to Semver? Isn't Semver just like yet another, uh, it's like the XKCD, there's all these different uh, standards, just yet another standard. Why are you hard coding to it? And I noticed that if you look at the C++, uh, spec for the package manager someone submitted, they have no actual definition for what versions mean at all. The version is just an opaque thing that, you're, that is, uh, in true C++ fashion, implementation defined. <laughs> like six people got that joke, but it's a true thing. <laughs> um, the truth is it doesn't really matter. Anything will do. Um, but we really do need a universal standard for describing what compatibility means in a way that a dependency resolver is able to understand. And you, it really could be anything, but Semver is the thing that everyone already does, more or less. There isn't a really an alternative. And Semver also is pretty, pretty close to what people were already doing before uh, Semver. Right? Semver is more of a canonization of what the C ecosystem was doing um, than it is a, a totally new system. So Semver is fine. Semver will do. Um, and actually, that is not, that's a thing that doesn't belong there. So, um, <laughs> sorry. So basically we need, I think a great package manager has some really strong opinions about what, how people communicate compatibility, um, what kind of compatibility ranges people should be using in their packages, and um, how we try to encourage them or discourage them from using things that they shouldn't use. As an example, Cargo will literally not allow you to publish a package that has the star dependency range. So star means anything. If you try to publish it, Cargo is like, no, that, that is obviously not OK. And it just doesn't allow you to publish it. OK. Uh, so next, I should probably stop hitting next before I finish the previous thought, but onward. Okay, uh, a good local package manager isolates projects on the same, same machine from each other automatically. I think this is pretty obvious to anyone who's used to using Bundler or Cargo or any of these tools that I had on the previous slide. It's obvious that this is true, but it, it, it actually isn't true right now about all um, about all languages, and it, can, and it was definitely not true in 2008. So I want to talk about what it is that I mean when I say the isolation happens automatically. So I was looking, uh, I happen to know that Python does not have a very good story here, so I was looking at how Heroku explains that you should use Python, and I think, I, I think it's fair to look at how Heroku describes their customers to use Python because Heroku is very motivated and interested to make something that is as smooth as possible because if they don't get it right, they're going to get a lot of bug reports. So I think this is probably a pretty good approximation of what you should do. And if you look at what they tell you to do, in addition to a bunch of steps that uh, we don't have to do in Ruby, at the end of the day, um, their isolation is the, of the uh, flat pack Docker isolation style. It's the thing called virtual env. And you have to write virtual env and give it a name. And that means that you have to think about what name you should give the project that you're in. And that also means that it's very difficult to automate the process, right? So let's say I say, uh, let's say Skylight is my project, and I say I automate that it should, my virtual M should always be called Skylight. There's no actual mechanism to confirm that nobody else wants to use that name. So if I automate that, and you automate that, and we both happen to use the name Skylight, and there are much simpler names like VNV that might actually be popular, basically if someone tried to automate this exact instructions, you would have a collision. 
right? So what, we real, what I mean by automatic, by the fact that it's automatic, is that there is no namespacing. There is no conceptual uh, step where you have to think about creating an isolation boundary. We have a directory that you're inside of. The directory has a gem file or a cargo.toml, and that is the way that we understand the isolation. The isolation is relative to the directory that we're inside of, and that's why I call it a local package manager. Um, and again, I think for people in the Ruby community, it might be like, oh, that is a very obvious, of course that's true. It just happens to not be um, a slam dunk when people build new systems like this. And this is, so this is something that Bundler doesn't have and I'm kind of sad about. Um, a good local package manager has some solution for optional dependencies. And one option, and this is the option that NPM does is, is what I'll call weak linking, which is sort of a rough analogy to how you might do a similar thing in C programming language. And here is just directly uh, verbatim from the NPM documentation. They tell you, you can declare dependency optional, but if you declare dependency optional, you need to write something like this. Something like, and they, by the way, you will observe that they do not actually tell you what the not good foo version function does. Um, and you have to require package.json, which probably, no, I, probably a lot of people here have written JavaScript and might not have even thought that that was a thing at all. Um, I mean, it's great that it works, but this is definitely a, quite an incantation to uh, deal with an optional dependency. And the MP, this is not me like making fun of them. This is literally what the NPM documentation tells you to do. And uh, just for clarity, the foo variable there is the optional dependency, right? So the foo is optional, and you have to do a bunch of stuff that I'm not, I don't, I'm not even really on board with all of this stuff, but I'll, yeah, I'll take it. But the point is that it's quite a bit of work to make it work. So you can have optional dependencies in NPM, but I'm, I'm on the fence about whether I consider this a real optional dependency system because of how much hoop jumping you need to do to make it work. Um, so maybe you're thinking, well, uh, what options are there? If a thing is optional, then you're kind of stuck because now you don't know if you have it or not, so what do you do? Seems like, seems like uh, NPM got themselves into a pickle that's maybe seem intractable. So, I will claim that a great local package manager has a better, a better solution than a DIY solution, DIY solution. And I want to talk a little bit about the Cargo Features feature. Um, so Cargo has a feature called Features. <laughs> I knew I was going to get myself into this trouble when I named it Features and I just didn't care. It's such a, it's a, it's, you'll see in a minute it's the right name for the feature. <laughs> so Cargo doesn't have optional dependencies per se. Cargo doesn't allow you to say, this dependency is optional. Because if you think about it, saying that a dependency is optional, as we saw in the previous slides, is really only a part of the story, right? You, there's another question, which is, what do you do with the fact that it's optional? What do you do if it's not there? And the way the cargo feature features feature works, and this, is, this was in the cargo documentation, and you will observe that it, if you're a Rails developer, it might look pretty similar to Rails, because the exact scenario that drove the feature came from Rails problems with optional dependencies. So the way the feature works is that any, any package can declare a list of features. Um, there's some, some stuff here that you don't need to really understand. But the key is that you can say, for example, I have a feature called uh, secure password. And the secure password feature means that it optionally pulls in bcrypt. Or the session uh, feature means that it pulls in cookie slash session. And you can also declare a default list of features which will automatically be pulled in unless people opt out of them. Um, and then you can declare these features as optional. Um, but the key thing is that on the receiving end, if you're using a feature, when you declare a dependency on the thing that you are uh, depending on, you can specify which features you would like to include. So instead of saying, uh, instead of sort of having to figure out how to do a handshake about what optional dependencies, the package that wants to declare optional dependencies has grouped them together into some sort of reasonable grouping in terms of semantic meaning, which means they can also make changes to those things. Um, one, of the th one of the cases that drove this for me was, the, uh, you can imagine Rails might want to have a Postgres optional feature. And the Postgres optional feature, it's actually unclear what gems it would include, what it would do, but it's reasonable to have a stable thing called the Postgres optional feature in Rails. So you declare that your features are, uh, you know, list the features that you want to include, and you can also specify that you want to disable default features. That's pretty unusual, but if you want to sort of get down to the zero and start over, you can turn them off. And in terms of how, what, how do you know what to do, whether or not the feature exists or not, if you, ha if you declare an optional feature, if you declare a feature called Postgres, then Cargo automatically creates a, uh, this thing is, is the syntax for basically ifdef in Rust. 
but a better version of if def, right? So you get a configuration flag, uh, effectively the equivalent of a defined variable for the feature name, and then you can use it inside of your code, and that hap will be uh, considered at compile time, right? So if you say CFG Postgres, and then the person who depended on you didn't ask for the Postgres feature, the cargo will just not even compile that code into the output binary. So uh, basically what the point that I'm making here in general is the feature feature in cargo is really about saying optional dependencies are not the end of the story. Really optional dependencies are describing a more general set of questions, which are usually clusters of feature, uh, clusters of optional dependencies, and then what it is that you should actually do if the feature is there or not there. And so CFG flags are how you handle the features there or not there, and uh, the feature de definition is how you create the, the clusters. And I think I like about this is that it still a lot, it gives you all the power of optional dependencies. I think there's even some sugar in Cargo that allows you to have a feature name. If the feature name and the optional dependency name are the same, there's some sugar that makes it easy. So you can still do optional dependencies, although, and you can use the CFG flag. Uh, solution for that case, but it gives you a nice rational and sort of a more general and expandable approach for dealing with what optional dependencies are really about. So next, uh, a good local package manager establishes conventions for units of code at the package level, even when the underlying language under only understands code at the module level. What I mean by this is that almost every programming language, not all, but almost every programming language does not have in its core semantics any notion of package. And it's up to the package manager to actually define what package means. And you might think, oh, it's just like a loose convention. It turns out to not be a loose convention. Um, it turns out, for example, if you look at what it is that a gem is doing, and none of this stuff has anything to do with the Ruby language semantics. It defines what dependencies mean. What are, what, when you declare a dependency uh, with a, a version range, what does the version range mean, and when is it satisfied? It tells you how to compile native dependencies, native extensions. It tells you how to find the library code and how to put it on the load path. It tells you how to find any binaries. Um, Bun, uh, RubyGems also has cryptographic signatures. And basically what this means is that the way to, in my opinion, the way to think about a gem or a crate or an NPM package is it's another unit of code compilation that is being, uh, that is described by the package manager. So when you install a gem, you're not just copying some code from here to here, it's not fancy curl. What you're doing is you're actually invoking make and compiling some native code sometimes. You're copying the binaries into a globally accessible bin location and maybe doing some additional work to make the binary work. You're making sure that uh, if it's cryptographically signed that it actually has the signature that you expect. Right? So these are all things that are really conceptually language level considerations, but the package manager is doing the, the definition for you. Um, Cargo has actually even more things, so it also has meaning of dependencies, um, but it also, and it also has compiling native code, sort of similar to uh, what uh, Ruby does, but then it also has uh, compile time plugins that have to be compiled and installed, so if you just wanted to compile a crate that you picked up from, any, from anywhere, you would have to remember to compile any plugins that were being used. Um, similar story about library code and binary code. Um, also, you have to configure those built-in profiles because things like what optimization level you want to use are actually important. Um, and then there's the optional features feature that we talked about. Right? So there's all these things, um, and the way I think about it is that you use Rust-C to compile an individual Rust file, and you use Cargo to compile a code unit that is a Cargo package. And I think that that ends up being roughly true. So now that we have defined, we have said that the package manager is responsible for defining what it is that a code unit actually is, even though the programming language itself doesn't understand what a code unit is. Uh, a good local package manager takes that information and makes sure that you reliably include the same source code for each build across all machines and across all environments. And notably, um, NPM actually says in their documentation, NPM install is not deterministic. So NPM install violates this, uh, this pillar. Um, now one thing that is not obvious, but has turned out to be very important in all the environments that I've ever worked in, is you shouldn't, um, you sh if you want to make the system deterministic, you have to consider uh, dependencies that are about other profiles, like if you're compiling, um, if you're compiling for release, you have to consider test dependencies. And if you're compiling on Windows, you have to consider Linux and vice versa. Because if you don't do that, then you're going to end up building a dependency graph that when you combine it with the other platform might totally change. 
So you really need to consider the superset of all possible platforms and environments and profiles when you build the dependency graph. So if you look at a gemfile.lock or a cargo.lock, you'll see sometimes if you run something on Linux, it'll say like compile, it'll say like downloading Win32 something something. You're like, why is it doing that? It makes no sense. And the reason it, the reason it's doing that is because it's considering the Win32 information. It's considering all these platforms to make sure that the dependency graph that it freezes in Ember is actually something that can uh, that can follow this rule that can actually give us a guarantee that we're getting the same source code across all machines and across all, all environments. Um, that said, a great, local, a great local package manager not only gives you guarantees that if you don't change anything that you get the same behavior, it gives you some guarantees that if you make a single change, if you say bundle update of a single dependency, that other unrelated dependencies don't change. And this is something I call this feature conservative updates. Um, Bundler has this feature, and Cargo has this feature, and whoever copied Bundler or Cargo correctly has the feature. Yarn actually does not have this feature right now. I have an open issue about it. And I think this is a pretty important thing, um, not because you can really make a lot of use of the guarantee, but because the mere fact that you have successfully significantly minimized the amount of uh, change over time reduces the amount of programmer cost in using a lot of packages. right? So I think a great local package manager thinks a lot about just reducing the change over time. Trying to make that a smaller amount of things. Um, additionally, a great local package manager caches as much work as possible between projects without sacrificing isolation. So this is something that I'm using a lot of caveated language here. But a great local package manager doesn't uh, compile everything in your local directory. And then the next time you want to compile the exact same thing, it repeats the process. It, if, if you probably noticed if you use Bundler that if you install Nokogiri the first time, it takes like 45 minutes, Aaron. Um, <laughs> but after that, it's fast because it's cached somewhere. Um, and the Ruby version of, of this is smart enough to know when ABI is changed, right? So Ruby has a careful, uh, careful understanding of when the ABI, uh, the binary interface, changes. Um, so that's why you'll see sometimes like Ruby 1.9.2 or something in your path, and you're like, why is that there, or 2.0? Like, I'm using Ruby 2.3, what's going on? And the reason is that that's the last time the ABI, the binary interface, changed for your uh, for Ruby. And so it's allowed to continue using the Nokogiri that it compiled for Ruby 2.2 for Ruby 2.3, assuming that that's not one of the times that the changes were made. So uh, what I'm really getting at here is that in order to accomplish this, in order to accomplish caching as much work as possible between projects, um, you really do have to think a lot about uh, determinism and re reproducible builds. So there's a big project sort of in the wider ecosystem to get reproducible builds. And really what reproducibility comes down to is having a very strict understanding of what your inputs are, probably having some kind of hash for all your inputs, and reducing the change as much as you can. So uh, you don't allow the clock to change as you're compiling, things like this. And in order to, the maximum amount of caching requires you to have a very, very strong sense of what all the inputs are, right? So as an example, uh, every time Rust changes, the, you, unlike Ruby, we don't have a stable ABI, you actually need to recompile things. So we would need to include the version of Rust in the, in the hash of inputs if we wanted to cache things. We don't do that right now um, because we don't, we haven't, thought through what all those inputs are. But I think a great local package manager, and, and Bundler is such a thing for this criteria, actually tries really, really hard to think through what might cause something to change and to cache as much as possible. Here's the thing that I think Ruby people have come to really rely on and is really non-obvious for a lot of people. I've had to really I've spent a lot of capital explaining this in other ecosystems, and it w has never been the first feature that I've added. Um, a good local package manager allows you to temporarily override any of your application's dependencies, indirect dependencies even, um, for, for emergency, fi emergency fixes, upgrades, or code development, and I'll say what those things are. So uh, before I say that, I think in general, uh, if you have a system that is very predictable and, very, and offers you guarantees and variants, it's very strong, uh, if you don't give people an escape valve, what, will happen, what happens is that they start saying, well, I'm really happy that you have managed to guarantee me that the bit-for-bit -bit pattern of my output is always the same, but I actually can't ship my, you know, there's a security vulnerability and I can't ship the security fix, so I'm not really, the, all this reproducible build thing doesn't really matter that much. So in order, when you have a system that tries to offer people extreme guarantees, and the trade-off for that is that there's some restrictions, it's really important to have some escape valves that people can use uh, to get 
uh, to get their job done. And I think in particular, Semver is a thing that's nice to ha it's nice when it works, and for the most part, people make it work, and for the most part, people uh, accept PRs. But um, I like to say, if you're going to drink, you should do it under my roof, right? Um, I think if people, uh, when people don't, when people for some reason cannot do a Semver compliant change, like there's a security vulnerability, it's good that it's good for people to not be doing it in some kind of extremely hacky way, but for people to have a clear way of, of accomplishing it. Um, so here are the scenarios that I'm talking about. Um, the most obvious and pressing one, and the one we hear from like Gecko when they're adopting Rust and using Cargo, is apps need to ship emergency fixes. If there's a vulnerability in the open in the TLS stack. Uh, Gecko doesn't have the luxury of spending a month to figure out how to upgrade all their dependencies. They actually just need to make the code change, recompile, and ship the version. So apps need to ship emergency fixes, and they need to be able to do that without having to mess with the versions. Um, sometimes upgrades actually require a lot of coordination. Uh, Servo has a pretty extreme version of this because of how much of their dependency graph they manage on their own. So when they have, uh, when they have the equivalent of like a Rails upgrade, they have to actually do all. So you like say, oh, I'll just wait for our spec to update. They actually can't do that. They have to upgrade our spec and literally everything else too. So um, sometimes actually doing that process requires some coordination that in the middle of it doesn't have as strong of a, a sense of the versioning story as, as the usual story. Um, and in particular, you, you, you end, the, all these things are about using code that has not been released yet, really. And another, another scenario, and this is the one NPM link is targeting and the bundle install local features targeting. This is like, I work on Rails, but I also work on eRubis. So I, when I work on eRubis, I want to actually use the one in my local copy against the version of Rails that I'm developing locally. And basically, all these scenarios call for some kind of override feature, basically a way to say, if you ever see uh, eRubis anywhere in the dependency graph, replace it with this thing I have on my local hard drive. Or if you ever see the TLS crate anywhere in the dependency graph, replace it with this emergency servo GitHub repo. Right? And that's something that, uh, there's a few different scenarios here, but they're all addressed by, at least at the primitive level, some kind of override. Something that lets you say to the dependency resolver, do your thing, but whenever you actually find this particular dependency, swap it out with this other thing I told you about. Um, that said, I think a great local package manager distinguishes between these three scenarios, and this is something that uh, Cargo has most recently been spending a lot of time on. Um, and the reason for that is that each of these scenarios has quite different requirements. So emergency, fi emergency fixes are usually a very small amount of code. They don't change dependencies or anything like that. And in fact, you really don't want your cargo.locked or your bundle.locked to update. You're like trying to ship an emergency fix. So changing other dependencies at the same time is very scary and bad. So uh, emergency fixes are sort of like make a couple of changes to your lines of code, have a GitHub repo, swap it out. Um, upgrades are a really different scenario. Upgrades, you're like, you have a lot of version, a lot of uh, repos, your versions are kind of out of sync, you don't really, the, the whole dependency graph might not even make sense at various points in the upgrading process. Um, and so you really don't, you don't want to uh, have many restrictions about what's going on because the restrictions will stop people from getting to the end of the story. It's not like, kind of like Git rebase, right? If Git rebase said, well, during Git rebase, your .git directory has to be in a consistent state, then you would never be able to get rebased because the whole point of it is that there's a period of time where it's not in a consistent state. And so upgrades are sort of like that. There, there are just too many things that are going wrong that make it hard to offer the same level of guarantee as the usual one. But code development is kind of the opposite. Code development is I have the local copy of eRubis on my local machine. It actually is really useful to get error messages that are like, hey, by the way, you didn't check in your code. So you just have a dependency on something that is literally only on your local computer. And, and Bundler does this. Bundler will give you warnings if you try to use, uh, have a, a local dependency that you didn't check in. Just like notices that you're, you didn't get check in things. So, uh, upgrades and code development are kind of the opposite, right? Upgrades want as little warning, as little, no must, no fuss, as much as possible, whereas code development wants to be as strong as possible about avoiding foot guns, because you literally have a thing that's only on your local machine. And this is something that I think you could spend a lot of time on. I think we're going to spend, hopefully, a medium amount of time and get to a good solution. But I think trying to use something like NPM link for all the three scenarios just doesn't end up being satisfying because of the, each one has its own foot guns and you want to address the foot guns with a targeted workflow for those things. I only have a few more left here. Um, a good local package manager tries to unify dependency ranges into single packages where possible. And I'll try to, I'll just give a couple of examples. Ah, let me fix this. It's going to be really hard to read. Sorry. I don't actually know if I can. Eh, okay, I'll just. So this is basically saying app.js depends on moment.js. Um, 
which depends on time.js uh, hat 1.1, and pretty time.js depends on time.js hat 1.0. And the key here is that those two packages, the one that says hat 1.1 and the one that says hat 1.0, they should really unify into one package. And it very, it, this is something that various package managers, even those that, try, that think that they're satisfying the requirements of the rest of this talk, often get wrong in various ways. Um, Yarn right now actually has bugs around this stuff. So uh, the idea is if you have two dependency ranges and they are, and is at all possible for them to point at the same package, they should point at the same package. Um, here's another example where I added tilde 130 to the app.js and those three packages should unify into not the one dot latest, but now one dot three dot latest, right? So you should try to take all the, the ranges and you should combine them into one thing. Um, the TLDR of this whole story is you actually, you need a, a resolver that knows how to backtrack because um, the thing that you saw first might have just had, the, basically what ends up happening is you see a range, it says hat 1.0. You're like, okay, no problem, that matches 1.6. You continue going on. Later on, you see something that says tilde 1.3.0. At this point, you just simply cannot unify those things into the same thing, and you have to backtrack to try to go back to find an earlier thing. And as far as I know, any real version of the algorithm is MP-complete. That doesn't mean it's a hard algorithm or that it's a slow algorithm. It just means that the one that you thought of in your head isn't actually the correct one. There, you have to write a, a thing that actually searches the space and backtracks. Um, I say that because there are at least 100 attempts in production ecosystems where people have tried to do things in their head that they think work and do not. The only solution is to actually search the space until you find the, the solution. Um, the Ruby ecosystem, you might have some envy about the fact that other ecosystems have duplicates. Um, we have what I call the Highlander rule, there can be only one of each gem. Um, but duplicates actually make this problem even worse because when you get into a situation where there's a quote unquote conflict, you actually have two choices. You can either backtrack or you can uh, just say, well, I can duplicate. I'm allowed to duplicate, so I'll do that. But I think it's actually important that if you can find a solution that does not require duplicates, that you avoid duplicates for reasons that I'll get into in a minute. And as a result, I, it makes a hard, it's a hard problem. You have to think about what is the heuristic that you're going to use to decide when to, when to consider it a, a soft conflict, basically, and when to say, damn the torpedoes full steam ahead. And just in general, this is, again, something that people, they convince themselves very strongly that they have a solution that is a simpler solution. Um, the actual amount of lines of code is like 100 or 150 in Yarn, in Bundler, in Cargo, and in every other system. It's not a lot of code, but it is an algorithm. It involves you having looked at an algorithm and some pseudocode and understood how it works. And I think people would rather not sometimes. Um, so if, if you're talking to someone about dependency resolution and they say, oh, I, it turns out it's very easy. All you have to do is you activate and then it's fine. It will turn out to be fine. Um, usually those things end up producing very bad results where you have a huge amount of duplication for no reason. Um, and like whether or not you think duplication is good or bad, unnecessary duplication is clearly bad. Now, this is sort of the last big idea I'm going to try to put out here. A great local package manager ensures that shared public types are always unified between the packages that share them. And I'm going to give an example of what that means in a moment. But I want to say again, for people who, are, who feel general envy uh, about other ecosystems that allow duplicates, those ecosystems have a really hard problem that is effectively still an open research problem as far as I'm concerned. I'm doing a lot of the research on it, but um, it's, there's no really good answer for how to deal with the shared public versus private, uh, pu public versus internal problem. And in almost all ecosystems that allow duplicates, almost nobody understands what the problem even is. But I'll try to, I'll try to explain it quickly here. So I'm gonna use a very simple case study that will help explain what the problem is. Um, the reason I'm using this case study is that almost every other time someone has tried to explain this problem, someone has replied with one of the following. Actually, your problem is mutation. Your problem is you're using classes, right? So there's a lot of different things that people say that to explain why the problem exists. And I'm showing you an example here that is a, the top thing is a thing that returns a very simple object. There's no mutation in this entire program. And the format function is a pure function. There's no classes. This is a very FP example. And the problem exists in this example. So. Uh, don't let anybody tell you that the problem has to do with some you are two, you, you Ruby OO programmers are causing the problem. That's not the issue. There's a different issue which I'll elaborate in a second. So let's look at 
uh, we have the time.js library, it's a very small library, and we have an app.js, and the app is basically, hopefully people know enough Node to like understand what this is doing, it's a very small amount of code, hopefully it's readable. Um, so the app.js basically uh, requires moment, it requires pretty date, and uh, moment that now gives you back a time object, one of the things on the top, and pretty.format takes one of those things and calls the format function on top. So I could have written all those libraries, but let's assume that they're very trivial, they don't do a lot. They just uh, maybe make it easy to write something like moment.now, which is not actually in the original library. So that's fine. Um, it's important to note here that when you called moment.now and you got back a time object, a, it's not just any time object got passed, a time 1.0 object got passed from moment.js to pretty time.js through app.js, right? So there's basically a dependency, an implicit dependency between uh, moment.js and pretty time.js on the exact version of time.js through their parent dependency on app. Now let's imagine, so so far so good, that's fine. There's only one version of time.js, so everything is great. Now let's imagine that we have released a new version of the time library, and all it does is, it, it's again, no mutation, I've not added the classes to the system, I've not added the dreaded OOP. All I've done is I've added one field to my record, the time zone field, and I have included it in the output. Right, so now, and now imagine that pretty time is like, oh great, I'm gonna upgrade to use time.js 1.1 because uh, it's a non-breaking semver change, which is actually true, just adds features, non-breaking, and I would like to get that feature. So I will depend on time.js 1.1. So we now have a new non-breaking version of time.js. There is no, this is not a gotcha, there's no actual semver violation here, it's fine. And hmm, what has happened here? I have, ah. Um, pretty time updates its time.js dependency, but there's a problem now, which is that a time 1.0 is still passed from moment.js to pretty time through app. So there was this implicit dependency between these two things that has not been eliminated at all, and now the problem is that time.js 1.1 is gonna stringify it incorrectly because it's gonna assume that it wants to emit a time zone in that space, and the time zone field does not exist. And this is literally the simplest possible example. So maybe you're thinking, oh, well, that's an edge case. It's a simple example. No, that is actually incorrect. Um, so just to remind ourselves what the shape of the problem is, the structure of this POJO, the time.js 1.0, is shared with this other unrelated package, pretty time.js 1.1, uh, pretty time.js, through this common parent of app.js, right? So we have a, a public API, the POJO uh, in time.js is being shared across our entire dependency graph without anybody explicitly doing it. And again, in case you think that this is like some kind of weird edge case, no. The problem is very general and it affects almost every single library that exposes data structures and functions that operate on them as part of their public API, which, by which I mean literally every library ever, right? Now, that doesn't mean that every single library ever has the problem. The problem only occurs if you take some dependency and you expose its uh, types, which might mean a data structure or might mean an instance of a class or basically any, um, Anything that you got from your dependency, if you expose that out from yourself to your parent, your parent can take that thing and pass it to one of its children, right? So if you, as long as, so underscore is a good example of something that does not have the problem. If all you ever do is use underscore inside of your own library, you have not leaked any underscore internals to anybody else, so you're fine, you can duplicate it from today till tomorrow, it's great. But as soon as you take any thing that you got from a dependency and expose it to your parent, Game over, basically, this problem exists. So again, you should be feeling good about the fact that Ruby does not produce this issue, despite the fact that I'm sure everybody is in general very sad about the fact that NPM people tell us that we have encountered our special version of dependency L. Now, again, I think it's very tempting to say that the answer to this problem is it doesn't actually matter. As, obviously, NPM has a huge ecosystem, clearly it doesn't matter. But in fact, that's incorrect. In fact, this problem comes up in a huge amount of ways. Um, NPM has a feature called peer dependencies, which is considered a bad practice, but is the only thing that even attempts to address the issue. So a peer dependency is basically saying, I am not allowed to have my own copy of this dependency. I have to share this dependency with my peers. Right? So if you remember the diagram I showed before, the term peer dependency makes a lot of sense in that, from that perspective. But nobody understands that. Right, so peer dependencies themselves don't really address the issue, and even the NPM people themselves have not done a very good job of making peer dependencies work very well. Um, but you have things like um, React is telling me that there are two copies of React. What's causing that? And the thing that's causing it is that there is no way of expressing, I would like to make sure that these versions of React unify. 
Again, this problem does not exist in Ruby. You cannot have two copies of Rails in your process. So there is no way for you to have, you know, a active record duration, active support duration from Rails 3.2 and somehow be passing it into a, a method that is expected that is from Rails 4. Right? That, but that happens all the time in ecosystems that have duplicates. Now in cargo, we have the a blessing and a curse. You get a static error, you get a compiler error if you make a mistake. Um, and we more or less have been leaning a lot on Semver to avoid the problem. So basically because of the fact that if you say I depend on 1.2 and someone else says they depend on 1.3, um, the fact that we'll both get one point latest means that in practice things unify well enough. But there's still a pretty big issue and it's still, it's still an open issue that we're working on in Cargo. And I don't, I don't think there's a very good solution. I think the only solution that is in production is the Highlander rule. The, one that, the thing that everyone thinks is terrible is the only actual solution that addresses this pretty terrible problem. And by the way, the reason why this problem does not exist um, with DLLs, which was the original problem, is that it is very uncommon for you to take, you use a DLL and then use an actual data structure that you got from the DLL and pass it to your parent to pass to some other DLL. Right? That's very un uncommon. DLLs are kind of more like standalone processes. But um, certainly it could happen and it would, the same issue would exist. So. Um, I just want to close by saying um, that was all a bunch of stuff about how you should build package managers, and I think it's involved, and if you ever want to build one, hopefully some of it will have been helpful. Um, but fundamentally what I'm talking about here is figuring out a way to address things that ultimately tear down people's attempts to build big things out of little things, right? So in order to build Rails, we actually do need to know that active support duration cannot be used with a you know, Rails 4.0 and a Rails 3.2 at the same time. And that's something that we have taken a lot of advantage of. We've built pretty high in the Rails ecosystem. And as a person who has worked in other ecosystems, I can tell you that the duplicate problem, as an example, is something that really does impact your ability to build a stable infrastructure up. Anybody who's worked on Ember CLI um, has experienced this over and over and over again. So uh, I'm not really uh, in this, at the, at the end here in my closing, um, arguing for any particular thing, except for the original, the details matter point which is uh, in order for us to be able to innovate, in order for us to, everybody wants to take things out of the big standard library, right? The big standard library where you know, packages go to die famously, everyone wants to get stuff out of there. But standard libraries have one major benefit, which is that there's only one of them, and that's a guarantee. And so you, don't, you never have to worry about, you know, you never have to worry about versioning or breaking changes. Basically, it's all part, of, part and parcel of using the programming language. Everyone who's using Ruby 1.9 has the exact same set of standard library. And in order for us to take what is an unfortunately centralized process that really doesn't work that well and expand it out into a bigger, uh, a bigger story, and so we could do things like the Servo project or the Rails project, we really do need to think about building package managers that are very predictable, that are very resilient, and that address um, shared coordination problems that are non-obvious, but really crippling if they're not addressed well. So um, I, I'll close with my usual challenge, which is that we should all aim to build higher. And uh, I think we should, we should use ecosystems that make it easy. Thank you very much. <laughs>